Honourable Member for Bow River. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I appreciate my colleague's orator before. He's obviously woken up the House. I'm afraid I'm going to put you back to sleep. <laughs> so thank you to my colleague. Uh, but I stand up here, Mr. Speaker, um, and with my honourable colleagues and Canadians who are paying close attention to the discussion we're having on the legalization and distribution, sale, possession of recre recreational marijuana in Canada. This is a subject that no doubt evokes many emotions on all sides. And I know there can be some strongly held views on this issue. I feel like the government has rushed into this bill without really to stop to consider all the consequences. They are doing it to meet a campaign commitment without considering all the repercussions the effect that this legis legislation scheme may have. In April, shortly after the legislation was introduced by the Liberals, I had the opportunity to host a series of community roundtable meetings with municipal officials throughout my constituency. I met with mayors, with Reeves, councillors, MLAs and media. One of the very major concerns that these officials had was respect to the timeline of this bill. The Liberals have introduced this very broad le legislation setting the minimum age, the number of plants, the potency of marijuana that can be sold. They've then basically told the province and the territories to develop their own implementation plan for the rest. That means, Mr. Speaker, there could be 13 different re regimes across Canada. The Alberta Municipality Association asked the province of Alberta to act leading up to what they knew was impending legislation from the feds. As a result, in Alberta, the provincial NDP formed a secretariat to deal with this issue. Great. The problem is the Secretariat in the province of Alberta is excluding the municipalities from being part of it. The Liberals keep talking about consultations with municipalities and municipal involvement, but how can this work when the province are tasked with doing most of the, <clears throat> most of the heavy lifting from the feds, the municipalities are fact left at making the decision-making process at the grassroots level. As a former mayor for many years, I have particular concern about the impact on communities on municipalities. Municipalities are really concerned about this rush to legalize marijuana completely. They're concerned about the fact they're going to have to pick up the tab for a variety of new responsibilities that are essentially being dumped on them overnight. Municipalities will be likely responsible for the enforcement, the zoning, creating an entire new set of bylaws surrounding this new regime. With respect to zoning and bylaws, there will be a long process. Staff will have to develop plans. There will be public meetings, hearings, advertising will have to be done. City staff, county staff, countless hours and resources for months. This is a time factor here. It cannot be rust, which calls into the question the government's timeline. Licensing is not a cash cow, and despite what some government side have said, they can't believe this. It will not be anywhere near enough to cover the new added costs of this regime for municipalities. Now, in a previous sitting of the House, I asked Liberals about concrete actions they were taking to support municipalities, seeing that they dumped such a huge burden on them with very little time to adapt. The answer was quite generic from the government side, and it's not something I'm particularly enthused about that answer. For example, a parliamentary secretary mentioned providing equipment and training but didn't mention who was going to pay for it. This does not help municipal planning. Another area will impact municipalities, they have to rewrite their HR policies because now they will have the threat of people coming to the work under the influence of marijuana. The last thing any municipality wants is having an employee operating heavy equipment under the influence. Enforcement means a whole new set as well of rules and regulations, planning, money spent by municipalities. So the Liberals have essentially washed their hands of having to do any of that local work on this file. You've told municipalities there's a big new change. You have about a year to implement it. Have a nice day. This is unfortunate because I'm sure what the municipalities in my riding would be willing to work collaboratively with their province, but they've been exempted from that. It's unfortunate that the province won't allow this to take place. Another area of concern that I've heard in the private sector while crisscrossing my riding, hosting community roundtables, was the concern surrounding workplace regulations regarding health and safety. 
These organizations, whether it be like small or medium enterprises, like ECS Safety in Brooks, in my riding of Bow River, or large outfits like oil and gas sector companies, there are some major concerns about work-related marijuana use and how it will affect their businesses. As we know very well, my home province, Alberta, has large oil and gas sector and requires a significant amount of labor. These sectors now struggle at times to have enough clean employees. Coming under the influence of marijuana now, this is another significant challenge they're going to be faced. I understand that the federal government must respect constitutional division of powers, and they say they're consulting with municipalities. And they talk about some of the 22 major cities like Toronto. In my riding, there's none of those 22 major cities. They're not talking where the vast majority of our rural people live. We're not with those major cities. So when they talk about consulting, they're talking with some of the 22 majors. That's not where I'm from. But they like, <coughs> but they can absolutely consult with the province to ensure they're going to support the municipalities. So there is a process they could do if they wish to do it strongly enough. The federal government could, by funding, support these new powers for enforcement. It could come through the form of equal sharing the tax revenue generated by legalized recreation marijuana. Let's consider the federal gas tax model, for example, where we cut out the middleman, which is the province, and the money goes directly to the municipalities, mostly. It's a prop if they don't, it's the property taxes who will end up covering the cost for this because municipalities will be doing the heavy lifting at the grassroots level. There are other ways the government may be able to support this as they rush to terms on this brand new piece of legislation. But if they don't take the time, if they push it too quickly, it's going to be the property taxpayers are the major source of the of, for the municipalities. As a result, taxes will go up in the local municipalities to pay for this scheme. Lisa Holmes, president of the Alberta Urban Municipality Association, said that many Alberta municipalities could the theoretically be ready in 2019, one or so years later than the government's deadline. If there are any way that government could be able to work with the province to provide them with some flexibility and timelines and implementation, this might work, maybe. Mrs. Holmes, Ms. Holmes understands the only way for a new regime will be paid for otherwise is by the property taxes in the municipalities. Another group of those concerned are many of the provincial premiers, including liberal premiers. The NDP premier of Alberta, Rachel Notley, has expressed concerns about the short timeline. There are many other issues that are arising from this legislation. For example, I found it somewhat distressing we're going to be encouraging people, young people, or people to smoke marijuana now, when for years we've been trying to get people to stop smoking. For years I was involved in a regional health care board and also as an educator. We worked very hard with the resources we had to deliver public education on any smoking issues. We worked hard to educate even the youth as young as 10 years old on the hazard of tobacco smoke. The goal of these campaigns was to ensure that these youth never started smoking, period. In one case, we had more money to do this than the Liberals are spending across the country in five years. Nine million dollars spread out so meagerly over five years is tragic. It's simply not enough. There is an opportunity here to mandate that federal taxes go to municipalities for health care promotion and prevention. A specific per percentage should be mandated by the federal government to ensure prevention is being adequately funded because nine million dollars is just blatantly wrong. In tobacco prevention, one of the biggest at-risk groups where prevention was least successful was with pregnant teenagers. We already have a situation where these young present girls, the mother and unborn child, are at risk. And the C45, the Liberals are adding a new toxic substance that is going to put these girls and unborn children even more at risk. Here's a disturbing fact. One in seven teenagers will get addicted to smoking marijuana once they begin smoking it and signal pregnant teens, that number is even going to be higher. The government is facilitating more by this by outright legalization. They're facilitating by making it easier for teenagers to get their hands on marijuana. This is a reason why we need significant funding for prevention, and it's up to the federal government to take the lead. It's not enough simply to download it. With all this in mind, I look forward to continuing the debate on C45 with the hope the government will reconsider the timeline we really need that reconsidered. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I look forward to any questions and comments from my colleagues. And let's compliment the honourable member for Bull River for his excellent timing. He got right to the zero there. Uh, uh, questions and comments, the honourable parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Justice. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my member for what I think is a very thoughtful and, and quite relevant uh, speech, and, and I, I particularly commend him for his observations and, and, and his comments on the challenges that a change in the way in which we strictly regulate and manage this, this problem is, is, may, could impact local municipalities. And, and, and I'm a municipal guy myself, and, and I've spent a great deal of time over the past several months traveling across the country, meeting with mayors, meeting with police chiefs, fire chiefs, people who are involved in public health, in, in, in bylaw enforcement. I recognize and, and I very much value and, and, and appreciate the comments made by, by the member opposite um, uh, with respect to that. I just wanted to provide, a, first of all, a comment, if I may, a, a, an assurance. Our government has made a I'll come to it, I promise. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I promise you that I'll come to my question in a moment. Mr. Speaker, I, I wanted to assure you, Mr. Speaker, and through you to my colleague, that our government is committed to ensuring that the revenue, our focus has been on reducing harm. But we recognize there's a revenue implication here. There's money that will be generated from this. And we've made a commitment that that money, from a federal standpoint, will be reinvested in prevention, research, treatment, and rehabilitation. And the conversations that we're having with our provincial partners is to, is to recognize that there needs to be an investment, an investment in, in the administration, the oversight, the accountability, and the enforcement of these regulations. And that means a partnership with our municipalities. I want to assure the member opposite that we recognize the importance of those municipalities, and I want to ask him if, if we all were united in this together, if he believes that that will do a better job of ensuring that our municipal partners have the resources that they need to fulfill their role in keeping their communities safe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to remind members that it's questions or comments, or are allowed to make a comment or ask a question. They don't have to do both. The Honourable Member for Bow River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank the Honourable Member for his, his comments and question. Thank you for the kind words. Um, I think that's part of the challenge that we have going ahead on this in the short timeline we have. I understand how consultation works and it takes a long time. I understand the relationship between the federal government and the province. The disconnect is to that municipality piece to make sure you ensure that that funding gets to them and you have really got to do a job of getting that done. And if you can get that done where there's a commitment that the municipalities can understand and it's clear and it's in black and white that it flows to them, that's the challenge. And I think if you can do that, you can make a difference. They need to know it. They need to plan for it. Uh, uh, questions, and questions and comments? The Honourable Member uh, for uh, Lady Smith, Nanaimo Lady Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A major employer in the riding that I represent in Nanaimo is a company called Tilray. It's one of 27 licensed under the MMPR federal framework that the Conservatives put in place. So they hire 120 professionals, horticulturalists, PhDs, people that left the silviculture industry that now work in cultivating marijuana. Uh, they're among the top five, five private sector employers in my region. Their $26 million capital investment turned in year one into a $48 million economic output in Nanaimo. They've created 215 direct jobs. This was zoned by the municipality. So I'm curious whether the member has had any experience with similar uh, municipally zoned operations that seem to work within the legal framework and benefit our local economy. The member for Bow River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from my colleague in the sense of the zoning issue. I think one of the things that we would find in the larger municipalities where they initially we have been looking at and locating, we're now finding and hearing that they may want to locate in more rural settings, which affects more of us outside the major 22 cities. That's a challenge that we need to be prepared for, but we need to know and understand what those implications are and how it would work. This is not a simple process of planning and zoning. It will take time. If they're to locate outside those major urban centers, it's going to take time to work with it. We need some more lead time than the timeline we have. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 